Today we are going to talk about what can be done for the dead. If someone has died, what can you do? According to Theravada Buddhism. A little bit of a spoiler, there's not much you can do. But there is something you can do and there's something that can be can be learned from this lecture, Dhamma talk today. We will talk about it. We will talk about the Dhammapada verse 165. We will talk about the Asi Bandaka Buddha Sutta. We will talk about a sutta called Nava Sutta. It's about a, a newly ordained monk. We will talk about Asaka Jataka, about a king who lost his queen and he was able to see what happened to his, his deceased wife, what happened to her. The Nava Bhikkhu, the Nava Suttam, is actually uh, just a small little story about while I was searching for information. It's actually not really related to this so much, but when I was searching for the Asi Bandaka Buddha Sutta, I came across this. And we could say it uh, changed my course of action. Uh, where I ordained and what type of monastery I was looking for, and I'll tell you that story as well. And I'll also tell you about um, one person I know who, who died that I met in Kauai. So let's start. Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase So again we are talking about what can be done for those who have passed away those who are who have died We'll start with the Dhammapada. Normally, this is a very traditional way to start a Dhamma talk, is to take a verse from the Dhammapada, to chant it, to go through the definition, uh, the English uh, meaning, and maybe some definition of terms, and then support it with either personal stories or other suttas or other stories, maybe some of the Jataka stories. So this is a very traditional way of giving a Dhamma talk. Atana hi katam papam atana sam kilisati atana katam papam atana va visudjati sundi asundi pachatam nanya anyam visudhaye What does that mean? Evil deeds are done by oneself and by oneself. One is defiled. By oneself, evil is not done. And by oneself, one is purified. Purity or impurity is individual. And no one can purify another person. These days we say evil, it's, uh, it, sounds, uh, it sounds really, really bad. It is bad. They are, there are things that if you do bad things, we could say, uh, you're the one who does those bad things. You're the one who is spoiled by doing those bad things. And if you don't do bad things, by, by yourself, you're the one who is purified. You're the one who is, who is uh, pure. 
you're not doing bad things. So your purity or impurities is individual. It's based on your own actions and not because of anyone else. So it's because you be because of your own actions you have impurities and no one else can work out your salvation like no one else can purify another. Of course you can listen to a Dhamma talk and you can become inspired to to do good things and to refrain and completely stop from doing bad things or evil things. You say papam. Papam usually translates as evil. But in simple terms, don't do bad things. Do good things. This has always been a, a theme of Theravada. It's very simple. It's very simple. But on a very subtle level, level it's, it's very difficult to do. There are so many subtle levels that cause the impurities. But when someone, you can be inspired to do good things and someone can, we could say, purify you. Like you can listen to a Dhamma talk, you can become inspired and you refrain from doing bad things and you get inspired to do good things. One of my translators, she told me, she says, I want to do good things until the day I die. I believe her. Why? Because she's doing all this volunteer work for me and uh, she's translated over 100,000 dictionary definitions already and she'll continue. So you can be inspired, you can be inspired uh, to do good things, but what does that mean when, when you die? So can we pray? Can we pray and, and clean out the impurities so that you don't have an unpleasant birth again or you can escape the unpleasant birth that you might already go? In Theravada Buddhism, it is for sure immediately another birth happens immediately after a death. There's no intermediate stage. There's no purgatory. There can be like ghost realms that one appears in that might be short-lived, but it's not automatic. It's not automatically that way. And so, uh, so immediately there's another birth could be human, human birth, immediately. Could be the heaven realm, immediately. If you have jhana, you could go to the Brahmic planes, to the Brahma planes. If you did something very bad and you died with this type of kama chosen, you can go to the animal realm, the ghost realm, or even the hell realms. All the different religions, they have stories about this. So, yeah, it's very important to, to know that when someone dies, there's really not much that can be done. The kama is already chosen. The destination is chosen. What I'm trying to say is that really you cannot do anything. If someone is in the lower realm, you cannot pray. And and have them come up. It's according to their kama. But there is one thing that can be done. I'll explain about this after this uh, story called the Asi Bandika Putta Sutta. It's a very, very famous sutta. And uh, Goenka, Goenka is a very famous meditation teacher. Even when I was a lay person, I did uh, quite a few of these retreats, even volunteered. And he has a story, he calls it Pebbles and Ghi. He changes it around a little bit. He sort of, it's a retelling of the story, we could say. He calls it pebble and ghee, pebbles and ghee. But uh, actually, um, 
I'll tell the story. So there was a, um, there was a person, his name was Asibandika Buddha. And uh, what this translates to is like sort of like a, a, the son of sword, sword strap. Probably maybe his father made um, some type of holster for swords. And uh, so he was called that name, that he was the son of this, uh, this sword strap, or because we could say a sword holster. Bandika is like a belt or a strap. So he says, you know, he, he approaches the Buddha and he says, there are these religious, uh, religious people and they carry water, uh, they carry water in a pitcher and they, they wear these, these sort of um, garlands of water plants, maybe like a lei of these water plants. And they go into the water they plunge into the water and then they light a sacred fire. And by doing this, it can, for the person who has died recently, it lifts them up and persuades the dead to go up to heaven. He says this. He says this to the Buddha. He says, you're a powerful man. You're a powerful man. You're a powerful being. Can you do this? And so, sometimes the Buddha, he, he answers a question with a question. And he also gives information in this way. And he says, if one does any one of the ten akusala, unwholesome actions, we say, if one does this, can they go up? What are the ten? He also explained this in the, in the sutta. So he says, uh, if one is killing, if one is stealing, these are the five precepts. If one is killing, one is stealing, one engages in sexual misconduct, one tells lies. Uh, they skip, actually, the, dr the drinking itself. And then there's, uh, they're telling lies. They tell divisive speech. They speak harshly. And they speak um, useless talk, we say. Furthermore, they're covetous, they're malicious, they have malicious, a malicious mind, and they also have wrong view. So if someone, if someone he asks, if someone does any one of these ten things, or a combination of it, and they're doing it all the time, Will they go up? Is it possible for them to go up? Up to the heavens he's talking about. And he answers, he says, no, no, Bhante cannot. And then he answers a little bit further. He says, suppose you took like this large, flat or broad stone, you know, I don't know, a stone maybe this big, big heavy stone that you need a, a very strong man to lift. And you, you take it to the center of a very large and deep lake. And you drop it in the lake. What happens to it? Of course, it, it sinks. It sinks to the bottom and very quickly. Very dense stone. And he says, if we, if we got a very large crowd of people, the spiritually attained people or whatever, and we got the whole population, to pray, oh, good stone, good stone, rise, good stone, rise. We want you to rise, rise up, please. And they, they, they go in circles and they, they do all this uh, rituals, whatever they can do. Rise and float and come to shore on its own. And he says, would you be able to have that stone rise up. He says, no, that's not possible. And then he says, we take a person who doesn't kill living beings. These are the opposite. These are the ten wholesome actions. Doesn't, he doesn't kill living beings. He doesn't steal. He doesn't commit se sexual misconduct. He doesn't lie. 
He doesn't have divisive speech. He doesn't have harsh speech. And he doesn't participate in useless talk. He's frivolous talk, we could say. He's contented. He has a mind of metta. And he has right view. Can this person go down if he's always like this? And he answers, no, no, Pante, cannot. He says, suppose you were to take a pot, a pot filled with ghee. Ghee is what we call clarified butter. It's very popular in England. Uh, England, sorry, it's very popular in India. And uh, it's like an oil made from butter. He says, you either take that or oil. He says, ghee or oil is a big pot. And you, you bring that to the middle of the lake, deep lake, put it in the water, and then you smash it. You smash that pot. What will happen? The oil or the ghee will rise up and stay arisen. It will stay floating. Because oil always floats, right? Same with ghee. And then he says, <laughs> then he says, you take a whole bunch of people, spiritually minded people, spiritually attained people or whatever, and you walk in circles, you do all your ritualistic things and you pray with your hands together and Sink, 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 sink bad oil. Yo, yeah, bad oil, sink, sink. Will that oil, will that ghee, will it go down? And he says, no, Bhante, it won't. So he was able to convince Asibandika Buddha that through one's own through one's own actions one is purified. Through one's own actions. Through one's own through one's own action one is defiled. It will cause you to go up, it will cause you to go down. Once, once that is complete, it doesn't matter what rituals you do. It's already, we could say, set in stone. Your destination. And it's like trying to have that heavy stone rise out of the water. Or if you've done good things, it's like ghee that is floating and stays afloat, stays up. So it's very, uh, it's very important that you understand that through your actions, the actions have results. Now, when I was a layperson, I was hanging out in a Lao temple. It was just a house near my, near my parents' home. And I used to visit that place, and there was a PTS, Polytech Society, set of books. It was many books. It was very expensive. It was over $1,000, I think, to get the whole set. And maybe about 20 books or more than 20 books. And I wanted to look up a reference of this Asi Bandika Buddha Sutta. And I wasn't familiar with the, the reference numbers. Even today, someone, not, not today, a few days ago, someone asked me how to find a certain reference and someone had to write a program in order to convert uh, 
the reference numbers that are listed, uh, we could say old school reference numbers or PTS reference numbers uh, to some other form of a reference because different books have different, uh, different editions have different page numbers, etc. So while I was looking for this story, which was called Pebbles and Ghee, I came across a sutta called Nava Sutta. And I read it, and that story, or the sutta, stuck in my mind. And it, it really helped me try to find a monastery that was suitable for my personality. And the story goes, there was, there was a newly ordained monk. Nava means new. There was a newly ordained bhikkhu. And they would go for alms round. And after alms round, uh, this newly ordained monk, he would, he would quietly go to his kuti while the other monks were doing chores related to the robes. Or maybe just general chores, community activities. But this monk, he was very quiet and he went to his kuti and he didn't do anything. And they told the Buddha, the Buddha was nearby, and they, they told the Buddha this story. And he says, well, you know, this is, we should look into this. And he says, tell this monk to come to see me. So they, the monk comes and they repeat the story, it's like three times. They say what happened, then the, the monks, they complain to the Buddha, and they say the story again. And then, uh, and then the Buddha says the story to the, to the monk again. Is that true? You're, after you come back from alms round, you're, all the other monks are doing these uh, duties related to the robes, and you're just going to your kuti, not doing anything? And the, the monk was uh, very um, confident in what he was doing. And he says to the, the Buddha, he says, I'm doing my work, Bhante. So the Buddha, he had, he had uh, the psychic power, and he could penetrate his mind and know the minds of others. And he could see that this monk had very, very good meditation, we call fourth jhana, fourth jhana meditation. And he could see that this would be a cause, this samadhi meditation would be a cause for him to fully penetrate the Dhamma, fully, to become an arhant, to never take birth again. And so he, the other monks were, I guess, were assembled at that time. And he says, he says you know, don't criticize this monk not by means of slack endeavor, this is a quote, not by means of feeble effort, is this Nibbana to be achieved. Nibbana is liberation. Release from all suffering. This young bhikkhu is a supreme man indeed. He carries about his final body, having conquered Mara, and his mount. And so, why was this important for me? Why was this, why was this sutta important for me? It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about now, but while I was looking for the Asi Bandhika Buddha Sutta, I found that. And while I was looking for monasteries, when I quit my job and I was looking for monasteries to possibly ordain, so many of the monasteries had so much of a work ethic in the monastery program. And I thought, oh, this is, this is not really good. I want, to, I want to be like that monk. I want to go to a kuti and I want to meditate. And so I, wasn't, I was not satisfied with the places I had visited until I came across to Pa'ak. And when I came to Pa'ak, you're allowed to meditate as much as you want. They prefer you to meditate as much as you want. 
And I remember when I was there, I was like, oh, where do I sign up? I want to join. I want to become a monk here. And uh, I was smiling because, yeah, I'm remembering, you know, how happy I was to find a place that encouraged people to, to meditate so that one can penetrate the Dhamma. And uh, it was a very wonderful place for me to ordain. I did ordain there in Myanmar in 2001. And then later, there's a whole story about how I <laughs> did this uh, reordination ceremony in 2007. But uh, by seeking out the references of this story, pebbles and ghee told by Goenka, sometimes they call him Goenkaji, I was able to come across that. And it helped form my opinion or idea of what the ideal monastery would be for me. So I thought I'd share that with you. It's also good to look up the references to also understand if something is changed. So there were some things that were changed in that story from the original story. And so it's very important to do that. And right now I'm in a monastery where I'm learning Pali so that I can read the original Pali instead of relying on translations, which are sometimes different from the original. So it's very important to look up the references. And while you're looking up references, you might find something else that pulls your eye, maybe by coincidence or maybe that's how it's supposed to be, that can change your life. Back to the topic. What can you do when someone dies? There's a Jataka story. There's a story called Asaka Jataka. Sometimes they call it the story of Queen Upari. Queen Upari was married to King Asaka, and she was very beautiful, very, very beautiful, and her personality and demeanor was very wonderful. But she died. She died at an early age, and the king was devastated. <laughs> he was so attached to her that he had her body sort of preserved, maybe like a glass case or something like that, and it was, it was put underneath the bed that he slept. It was put underneath the bed that he slept on. And it was, it was stored there. And he was just lovesick. He was so devastated. And there was a bodhisattva. There was a bodhisattva who was a hermit. And he had attained psychic powers. And he was able to show the king what the new existence was of the queen. He could do that. He had this fourth jhana and he was able to make a determination that uh, he could see and then he could see. And actually, the queen was reborn as a dung beetle. Sometimes it's translated as a worm. But for the most part, we know it as a dung beetle. And she, she was intoxicated with her beauty when she was a queen, and she neglected the five precepts and other merits. And that's why she was born as a dung beetle. She could find the pleasure of dung, poop. <laughs> you know, these beetles, they, they, they cut the poop and then they, they roll it around, you know? And uh, he, told the, he told the king what his wife was. And the king didn't believe that this was really true. 
And so he made a determination, may the king be able to see the queen and talk with her. And he went into this uh, deep concentration state, made this determination, and then came out of it. And then he was able to see this dung beetle. And the, the king asked, you know, were you really the queen? Were you my queen in the past, in your past existence? She says, yes, I was the queen. I was a queen. I used to walk in this very same pleasure garden. But now I'm married. She said, now she's married to a dung beetle husband. She has a husband. And she said she would kill. She's so devoted to her husband, who is a, a dung beetle, that she would kill the king and let the blood flow down. And she would give it to her husband, his, the king's blood. Once you're, once you're born a certain way, you become attached. You become attached to that. It's one of the first processes that happens. You become attached to that existence. You enjoy it. Could you do anything for this person who has already died? Not really, huh? Even that, even that beetle could remember the past existence, but there was no, not even a, a slight remorse for the birth that she had as a dung beetle, and she would even kill the king so that she could give the blood to her husband, her dung beetle husband. So what can you do? If you're born as a, if you're, born, if you're reborn as a human, so immediately after death, that person is in the womb already, busy being a baby. This would be a very good condition, a very good condition to be human, again, because the Buddha says, rare is the human birth. Maybe we'll talk about a, a very famous sutta that talks about that. The Buddha also said this every day about how rare, rare is the Buddha, and rare is the human birth, and rare is Pabaja, the chance to become a monk. He would give this as a daily talk. If someone's really good and they're born as a as a deva, a heavenly being. But they'll be looking down on you. A lot of people think that. A lot of people who have grandparents who died, they might think, oh, my grandmother's looking down at me and she's happy with the merits I'm making and, and that's good. And so that's good. But there's not really much you can, you can do. You can share merit with them. You can let them anamodana, we say, sharing merit, and say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. The devas also help the virtuous people. I've, I've had some stories where some magical, magical things have happened to me when I needed help the most. Not really the most, but when I needed help, things magically came my way. Maybe it was the devas, I don't know. But we, we share merit with the devas a lot. It's like giving a, a good product review. You, you get a good product and you want to let other people know that the product was good. And the manufacturer, the seller also likes that. He likes to know that he did a good job if he helped. And so we, we share merit with the devas a lot in Theravada Buddhism. The hell beings, the people who are born in hell, they're, they're just too busy suffering. They can't, they can't, there's not much that can be done because they're, they're too busy suffering. In the ghost realm also, they're very busy suffering. 
But there is one type of, of ghost in the Peta realm. Peta is ghost, hungry ghost. Paradatu Pajivika, hungry ghost. And you can make merit. You can give, you can give uh, some donation. And there's uh, three things that have to happen. You give a donation to someone who has good morality. A lot of times they give to monks because monks, uh, it's part of the livelihood to, to be good. But there are other people with, with good morality. Sometimes you might know some, some lay people and you think, oh, this person is such an angel, right? Usually if you call someone, you, you reference this person, oh, he's such a good person, he's such an angel. Usually these people, <laughs> they go up like the ghee. Like I said before, the ghee or the oil. They're virtuous. They follow the ten courses of wholesome action. They refrain from doing the ten courses of unwholesome action. The second thing that must be done is the purity of the person you're giving to. The donor, he gives, he gives to someone who is pure. The donor shares merit. Dhammo nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyateo. Usually we say that. So the donor shares merit. May, may, all, may all my uh, past relatives be happy and to share in this, in this merit. Now in samsara we have... <laughs> We have so many rounds of rebirth. And so if you, if you go back in your family tree, five or ten generations, you'll see that there are so many people who are related. And when you count a samsara, it's infinite. There is no being in the world today that has not been your relative. So we say we share for all relatives. We don't just share for our grandmother or grandfather who died, or it could be a husband or a queen that died. You, you share with all relatives, whether you know them or not. So the first one is you give, you give something that is good to a good person, a good morality person. You share merit, and the third thing is that the past relatives those would be this special type of ghost, the, the hung, hungry ghost, this paradatu pajivika. They live off the merit. <laughs> they're able to live off the merits. And they, they're very hungry, but when you, when you give, when you give uh, like food, we could say, then if you do these three things, because of their own merits, not because of what you're doing, but because of their own merits, especially with them rejoicing in this, then this uh, food can appear to them and then they can stop being hungry. They can stop suffering. So, what do you do if someone's reborn as a human? Like I said before, they're already in the, in the womb. They're already in the womb. When I was in Kauai, in Hawaii, sometimes you might hear it as Hawaii. It's the islands in the Pacific. It's part of America. There was one person I met who had Alzheimer's disease. And his wife was taking care of him. And they happened to uh, need to go to the toilet. His Alzheimer's was mild at that time. But he still needed someone to take care of him. And he needed to go to the toilet. They went into a, uh, <laughs> I think they went into an expensive hotel. And uh, there was uh, a newspaper, a newspaper which announced some teaching that I was doing on the island and they decided to go to this teaching about learning how to meditate. 
And that's how I met them, by chance. They happened to see this article on me, and they came to a teaching, one of the first teachings I did, I think in 2018. And now, Keith was Buddhist. He was a very Buddhist. He had this set of books. It was very expensive. Not many people in the world have this book, these sets of books. Not even one of them. They just have, but he had a whole set of these books from what I've heard or what I remember. And he was, he was Buddhist and he was a social worker. He was a social worker is like a therapist in, in many cases, can be like a therapist. My brother is a social worker. And he has a, his therapy like, you know, for people going through difficult times. And he was, uh, I felt he was a really good person. And so uh, they asked me if I would teach privately. Sure, why not? <laughs> and uh, so I, I became close to them. And I decided to teach metta because uh, there's, there's a sutta called metta nisamsa, which is the 11 benefits of practicing loving kindness. And the, I think the, the, last, the second to last uh, benefit is that, might be a different one, but one of the benefits is that you die in an unconfused state. You don't die confused. And so I thought that this, this would be good because, you know, even if the, these results, which are the result of the highest level of loving kindness, meditation, bringing someone all the way to the third jhana, and to the highest level, then we get these results, but there's always a result that happens. And so I had faith that this would help him somehow. And so we, we practice loving kindness in the hope that this would help him. And his wife was always taking care of him all the time. And I told the wife, I said, you know, you're, you're always very busy and, and um, why don't I just go for a walk with, with Keith and you can take some time to yourself. And so we decided to walk, uh, what is it called, Hideaway Beach, I think it's called, in Princeville. And we went to Hideaway Beach. And I'm walking with him. It's a 20-minute walk, 30-minute walk. And I'm walking with him. And, and I know his story that like, when, when, the tsunami ha when the tsunami came to, to Thailand, also came to Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, I think, he just jumped on a plane without, uh, without thinking about it. He jumped on a plane. And he just started volunteering, and I think he did maybe some counseling work or whatever he could do. He was there for, I think, three months. He wanted to help. And I knew he was a, a, a good person. And while I'm walking with him, you know, he's, he's Alzheimer's. He's old. And Alzheimer killed him, actually. And and I, I asked him, I said, do you, do you want to go to heaven in your next life or do you want to become a monk in your next life? And we're just walking, I'm just casually asking him this question because he's Buddhist. He's Theravada Buddhist. He believes in, he believes in Buddhism, cause and effect, and he had, the, he had the books, you know, he's really dedicated. It's over $1,000 to get all those books. And I assume he read them. And so I just casually said, do you want to become a monk in your next life or do you want to become you know, a heavenly being? Do you want to go to heaven? And without hesitation, without hesitation, you know, he's, he, he's just always sort of living in the moment. He says, I want to be a monk. Without hesitation, he, just, he said he wanted to become a monk. And I was, I was a little surprised by that, but but I thought it was just so wonderful. It was, a, it was such a wonderful surprise. And so I, um, I was notified when, when he was in hospice and he was nearing his death. I kept in touch with his wife. 
and she took care of him until the very end. And uh, we made a, a chanting, a chanting video, and I made a separate, uh, just a voice recording. And it was, um, it was Namo Tassa, Ti Sarana, Five Precepts, in Metta Sutta. I think that's what all it was. Ti Sarana is, um, uh, and uh, also the, uh, the, the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha as well. So these are very, very familiar chants for someone who's a Buddhist. And I made these, these chants for him. It wasn't very long. I think it was maybe seven or eight minutes. And I asked two other monks to, to do this with me. I had mentioned one, one monk, one monk uh, in my last talk, one of my last talks, who's just this really good monk that I'm happy to see and then I smile all the time when I see him. And I asked him uh, to do this and he's, he quickly volunteered. And then there was another monk who's no longer here. And we, we chanted. These are very easy chants for us to do, very, the, some of the most popular chants. And these, these chants were played for him, I think maybe, like maybe in uh, repeat, repeat mode. And I heard, uh, I heard near the end, it started to calm him down, especially near the very end of his, his life. And so, you know, so if someone's born human, you know, he's, uh, he's born already, I think. It's been, been long enough now, his baby now. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe he'll become a monk. Maybe he's born in Thailand. I think, I think if he becomes a monk, I think he, he's most familiar with Thai Buddhism. So maybe he has this, this wish. I don't know what his mind is, but he was very quick to answer that he wanted to become a monk. And there, there are monks. There are monks uh, who have it in their their sort of their pre-existing life to become a wit, they had made a wish to become a monk, and they become a monk. There's one monk I, I know, um, <laughs> he was a very cute little monk, and uh, he wanted to become a monk, and his parents wouldn't give him permission, and he cried for two weeks continuously. <laughs> and he, he eventually became a monk. There's another monk I know, he's, he's actually here. And uh, he used to, when it was time for, I think, for dinner or something like that, he used to walk outside and he had like a little plate and he would walk outside and then come in with his plate. And, uh, and there's another monk who, uh, I forget, he went around in the neighborhood also maybe collecting food or something like that. And so they, they have it in their, we could say in their blood, but in their, in their there's like a karmic, comic wish to become a monk. And then some of these actually can become, you know, we have child prodigies, you know. It helps people know about uh, past lives, you know, like these, you have these six-year-old, six-year-old, uh, uh, eight-year-old uh, people, they can speak multiple languages, they're like experts and usually they, they know mu music very well. I think Mozart was like one of these child prodigies. And uh, they just have like amazing powers and you wonder how they get it. Some are good in mathematics or whatever. And uh, we also have child monks. There's one floating around in Myanmar right now. There's <laughs> now with Facebook and everything, we have all these viral videos and so you see all these uh, videos of this, uh, this very young monk who's uh, giving Dhamma talks and the ceremonies to hundreds of people and his demeanor, you know, the way he, 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 um, he talks to the crowd is, is like someone who's, you know, been a monk for 30 or 40 years. And even when he coughs, he's holding the mic like this and, and when he coughs, he like turns, he knows to turn his head to, to cough so that the cough does, doesn't go directly into the microphone. Things like that, you're like, wow. Of course, if Keith, he becomes a monk, 
he's not a monk wishing to be a monk again. He's a lay person wishing to be a monk, maybe for the first time, or maybe he took a break for a couple of lives, or one life. Whatever the case is, you can help someone in their honor. You cannot really know for sure. You cannot really know for sure, like, is this really, was this the person I knew in this life who is now a monk in this life or something like that. But what you can do is you can support people in the honor of the deceased person. And who knows, maybe you just might meet that person again. What did this person like to do? You can make merit in this area. And perhaps you could be helping this actual person. Or someone like him, you know. There are infinite beings, and so you can help someone. And this can be a person who is, uh, could be your relative, for sure is your relative, can be anyone. And we can share merit with the departed ones. So what can be done for the dead? Like I said, not much. But you can, you can give in honor of that person, and you can share merit, and you can... Uh, we, we talked about a lot of things, the Dhammapada verse. Evil deeds are done by oneself, and by oneself, and one is defiled. By oneself, evil is not done, and by oneself, one is purified. Purity or impurity is individual, and no one can purify another person. This is the Dhammapada, verse number 165. We talked about the Asibandaka Putta Sutta, with the big rock, the big stone, that gets dropped into the middle of the lake, and the pots of ghee and oil that are smashed. One sinks, one floats. The rock sinks, and the oil and the ghee, they float. And this is related to doing wholesome courses of action and doing unwholesome courses of action. If you do that, you're like, if you do unwholesome things, you're like the rock, the big stone. And if you do wholesome things, you're like the ghee, you'll stay afloat. We talked about asakajataka. Where, where there was a, a cow dung, the queen was reborn as a cow dung beetle. And she was attached to her life and her new husband. Life carries on. But she, she was like that because she neglected the five precepts and she didn't make wholesome merits to lift her up. It's not much that could be done for her. And she even said that she would kill the king and f give the blood to her husband, her cow, her, uh, her, dug, her dung beetle husband. <laughs> we talked about the Paradatu Pajivika, these, these petas, these hungry ghosts, that can live if you share merit to them. You give, you give to a, uh, a person who is wholesome in his virtue, you share merit to all beings, or specifically those relatives, but you, you share to all beings. And then these, these beings, they, they can rejoice, and then they can get the benefit. A lot of time in Thailand, when someone dies, and after they give a, after they give a donation to the monks, they, they pour water. And this is to represent that, uh, that they will get the merits. So humans are busy being humans. But who knows? Some of them, they can be born maybe as monks if they wish to become monks in this life. And hell beings are busy being hell beings, and Brahmas are usually being busy with their samadhi.
and we talked about the Nava Sutta and how I found that from the Asi Bandhika Buddha Sutta. While I was looking for a reference, pebbles and ghee from the Goenka. It's the story of doing, doing my work. The monk who, who wasn't, wasn't getting involved in the work with sewing robes. And he says to the Buddha, you know, I'm doing my work, Bhante. Bhante, I'm doing my work. And the Buddha says, not by means of slack endeavor, not by feeble effort, is this noble dhamma or nibbana, is this nibbana to be achieved, the release from all suffering? This young bhikkhu is a supreme man indeed. He carries about his final body, having conquered Mara and his mount. So he's saying that if you work hard, you can make an end of suffering. And so I hope that you can be inspired from this teaching. This is something you can do. What you can do is inspire people to follow the Dhamma while they're still living, to follow wholesome courses of action, and to make merit while they're still living, so they can be like the ghee, so that you go up. But what's most important is to be like this young monk who is practicing he was practicing, obviously, morality, but he was also practicing, practicing samadhi. And with that samadhi, the, the Buddha could see that he would attain, he would attain the Dhamma to the end, having carried about his final body. And so I hope that with this Dhamma talk, you can be inspired to follow the ten wholesome courses of action to follow morality and to practice samadhi so you can see the realities as they are, impermanent, suffering, and non-self. And to see the causes as well so that you can reach Nibbana safely and quickly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.